Akir Saqib here with the Swift Podcast. Three, two, one. Here we go! What's up, everybody? So we're back with another episode of the Swift Podcast. So today I bring on a good friend and colleague of mine, Adam Ibrahim. He is studying at USF soon and pursuing his PhD. Um, just earned his master's, enjoying the research life, pursuing a PhD in, uh, soon for kinesiology. Um, and I've been following his work for the last couple of months. Uh, really strong athlete, strong in powerlifting. He has his own company that they're working on optimizing performance and move for people. And I really admired his work. That's why I'm bringing him on today to talk about the beautiful sport of powerlifting, getting stronger, but also how do we maximize fat loss and get ourselves the optimal body? So Adam, welcome to the show, brother. How are you? Hey, man, I'm good. First off, appreciate you having me. Uh, appreciate the kind words. Um, it's It's been a journey. That's all I can say, man. And it's it's been a lot of fun to kind of be here uh, and talk and shop with a lot of these things that you know, I enjoy doing in my personal life and helping clients, um, hopefully, again, live their, their best life as well. Absolutely. So let's hit the ground running. So give me a little background about the, the, the research side of you in terms of being, you're going a PhD student, but, you know, the master's side, what read the research on you? Because most people don't spend a lot of time in research. They want to get out there and train and just go in that aspect. So what made you want to do that? Um, I would say, you know, the research aspect of me, um, it was never... Something I like to be honest, if you would have told me three, four years ago, this is what I would be. Um, I would laugh at you because very similar to you. Like I always had a passion for therapy. I literally did PT school uh, for half a semester um, at University of St. Augustine. I applied to five schools, did nice. tons of shadowing hours, L literally did a bunch of that. Like I thought um, I was going to be a doctor of physical therapy. Um, but again, I did it. Uh, was really scared and really intimidated, you know, in the aspect of the amount of debt that I was going to occur. Um, so I guess you can say uh, I dropped out, um, ended up being a high school teacher for a year um, and always found myself, you know, uh, either in <clears throat> PubMed or, you know, the mass application of research, just always reading research and, you know, applying it to myself, my current clients. Um, and through my undergrad at finishing my undergrad at USF, I had reached back out to my mentor, Dr. Bill Campbell. I said, hey, like, I, there's, there's, more, I, there's more in my life. Like, I, I love, you know, um, teaching high school kids. I love coaching basketball at that level. Um, but it's, I'll be straight up honest, the administrative aspect really pushed me out the door uh, because I wasn't doing shit by the book. Yeah. Um, things were happening, right? I was working with a lot of uh, EBT kids, kids potentially dropping out. But I was getting the kids to show up doing work. Uh, but it wasn't by the book. And they didn't like that. Um, and, you know, I was like, well, there's more to, you know, objective measures, right? You have to kind of meet these kids where the middle, you have to find whatever purpose th that it fits in their life to kind of match them and meet them where they're at and find their purpose. Um, in doing that, it, it didn't mess well. Um, so I was very fortunate. Again, I reached out to Dr. Bill Campbell. I was admitted to their master's program, um, was a graduate and a research assistant. So I helped out with uh, a couple of few studies of the diet refeed study of Dr. Bill Campbell's lab. Um, as well as the rapid fat loss that we will uh, this coming weekend present at ISSN in St. Pete. Um, and then I was also involved with Dr. Uh, Samuel Buckner um, this past my last year in the master's program. And we studied a lot of muscle physiology. Um, as you probably know, we critique periodization quite frequently um, just because of the lack of evidence or the backbone of, um, you know, stress with Hans Selyer, um really wasn't meant for exercise science but us as a field we took that aspect and approach to it and ran with it um and honestly just got off a really great podcast with uh john kiley um who is another factor that really heavily critiques periodization um and was you know educated in that aspect of right exercise the prescription aspect is really important right don't get me wrong but Absolutely. um i think you can even avouch it for the rehab aspect of it, is being able to educate and make these individuals feel more autonomous this throughout their approach 
Um, and with that, when you have that client buy-in, you can literally get them to kind of do anything. Um, but I feel like I'm getting a little off topic here, but I guess that's kind of a that's research beautiful. background. But now, yeah, but now I'm going to start my PhD at the University of Tennessee um, in Knoxville under Dr. Uh, Dr. Uh, Kelly Strohacker, which is more of the exercise adherence approach to resistance training, right? Because we all know exercise is good. Um, but still to this day, about 97% of Americans are still obese or overweight. Um, obviously, we know exercise is good, but how can we get it more, uh, I guess, advantageous for individuals? How can we get it more exciting uh, for these individuals to, to sustain that approach and get everyone healthier? Absolutely. And you're on topic, brother. That's what we're here for, right? The conversation. <laughs> so let's talk about that. So we're talking, a main topic that I want to talk about is optimizing fat loss and movement, right? So what is the, I guess for you, what do you think is the missing link in this nation on why we aren't getting people into that position? Um, you know, I really think a lot of it has this dogma of it's an all or nothing mindset, right? We always think if it's got to be perfect, um, and if I'm not perfect, why the hell am I even doing this? Um, and I always have a phrase, right? It's consistency over perfection. I always try to get my clients and even myself, right? It's all about the daily dub, controlling what we can control in the moment at the day. Um, and I think, again, that's what a lot of people, right? We, it's, it's eliminating a lot of things when, right, instead of making fitness consume your life, make it become a part of your life. Um, and when you do that, right, we start enjoying that process rather than getting fixated on the end goal. Um, because when we start fixated on that end goal, right, I feel like we lead to burnout a lot more often or much more frequently. And we quote, don't quote cheat a lot more, um, because right, we're, we're fixated in this narrow mindset rather than, you know, thinking it through a different lens of, right. There's no such thing as a good food or a bad food, but there's this, again, there's this dogma thinking of, right. It's good or bad, or if it's, it's black and white, rather than having this dogmatic approach to things, um, being more open-minded and, I think specifically understanding maybe the baseline factors of, right, if you're in a surplus, you're going to gain weight. If you're in a maintenance, right, you're not going to gain weight. But if you're in a deficit, more than likely you should lose body fat. Um, there's obviously a, tons of variables that kind of uh, need to be taken into consideration. Um, but I think, you know, the ground rule is stop having that all or nothing mindset or no approach to anything in life. Because Absolutely. if it's – we look at, at a different aspect – um, and another analogy I like to use is like car dealership, right? If you're going into a uh, Hyundai or whatever it may be to get a new car and you go in with a set mindset of like, this is what I'm going into, but they kind of act it and say, Hey, no, APR is going to be 15% and I need 5,000 down, right? That's a lot at one time. And more than likely as us, we're going to be like, the fuck? Hell no, I'm not doing that. But with fitness, if I tell you, or if people tell you, Hey, I need three hours of cardio. I need you to eat 1,000 calories. Easily we'll gravitate that. But then again, is that sustainable, maintainable for the long, for now, as well as the long haul? More than likely that answer is no, but it's sexy and it feels like we're working really hard to get whatever we want to happen. And I think that's the biggest factor, even when I was a trainer and going into bodybuilding competitions, it's the end goal is stressing you out. So when working out and part of fitness becomes a chore, you're going to hate it. You're going to be miserable as hell. You're not going to want to do it. And it's like finding the right approach for yourself. So that chore no longer becomes a chore. It's a hobby. You enjoy doing it and you find that aspect. And also, I think one of the biggest things both of you can talk about is the carbohydrate aspect, the fear of carbohydrates, of people not getting enough of carbohydrates or the fear of calories. I've told mm -hmm. clients plenty of times, hey, you need 4,000 calories to start losing weight. And they look at me like, I got to eat more food. Why? What's going <laughs> on? Right? Do you agree or do you disagree? No, I totally agree, man. You'll find, I find myself more or less talking clients out of dieting. And I kind of have that aspect of, right, you come to me, or I always take a client as a very case study approach, right? We're yep. using first one, week one, baseline week. I want you to just track your calories and see where you are at. And a lot of individuals that come to me eating less than 100 grams of protein um, on 1,200, 1,500 calories. And I'm like, listen, right? Rule number one, as we said before, to start a fat loss phase, we need to put you in a deficit, right? And you're already telling me, right, you're fatigued, you don't feel really good um, optimizing your performance in the gym, and things are just really aggravating you right now. So why the hell am I going to feed that? Okay, let's have a different approach of, like you said, increasing calories, more importantly, increasing your metabolic flexibility, increase your metabolic bank, another way you want to phrase it, 
uh, but more importantly, increase or improve your relationship with yourself as well as nutrition. Um, and with that, right, a lot of that stress that we talked about earlier subsides and you start seeing more improvements within all of those aspects you just mentioned, well, eating more food. And you're just like, what is going on? And it's nothing magical. It's more of like you, I think you have a better understanding. Um, and with that client buying a lot of that stress and that coping, that cortisol, all kind of subsides and you're able to kind of see a new world. <laughs> Absolutely. And I think that's the, the biggest thing is making them realizing in their buy-in, right? It's a lot harder for us to coach and tell people saying you should eat more food and it's actually better for you. They're going to mm -hmm. be hesitant to but with the proper approach, proper research, proper education, we can do it. And then maximizing occurs in terms of you mentioned metabolic bank, you mentioned metabolic rates for those who don't know what those things are. Give me the simplest definition for it. Uh, so you, I like to think of the metabolic bank is right. your resting metabolic rate. So that is pretty much what you do at rest. So that's your calories of literally just sitting at a bed, not doing a damn thing. But right when I track our maintenance calories for that week, that's literally you, you doing you. So it's the best way to, in my opinion, figure out where you are and where your metabolism is, um, right? Trying to take into other variables of, you know, uh, steps and dieting history, right? We do all that, but having that, that snapshot of somebody's life um, really under, let, allows me to understand, hey, where is their metabolism really at? Um, and again, more or less their mindset. But I guess the metabolic bank is, again, what you are consuming in a specific day, whether it be protein, carbs, or fats, or whatever it is, that's what you think. And I, again, maybe to dummy it down a little bit, think of it as your budget within uh, your spending uh, of your month or however your day. Um, that's how I like to phrase it, right? The more the more bank or the more money you have, the a lot more freedom and autonomy that you have to spend or go out and do things, right? But when you're here and you only have $100 to spend, right? I can't really go ahead and spend $80 on, uh, I guess, uh, some flashy uh, a toy. But if my metabolic bank or my bank in general, my money in general is, let's say, $2,000, that $80 thing is not going to mean too much. So it's all, I guess, conduct dependent. Um, but more or less, the metabolic flexibility, I would say, is you able to utilize certain macronutrients to your advantage. Uh, and more or less, the metabolic bank, I like to say, is just your caloric expenditure that you're going to have on a specific day or a specific week. Absolutely. And again, this is just kind of giving you guys a taste of what it is, right? There's so much more that goes into it, so many factors you have to consider for appropriately prescribing and diagnose, giving someone the proper diet, proper nutrition planning, so forth. Um, and it goes back in the time when nutrition time is a key component, right? What are your thoughts? I've initially, right, when I first started, I was all about it. Nutrition timing, do this, do this. The only one I really care about now is my post-workout, pre-workout meals. The rest, I kind of play out of when it's important because I've read so many different articles, so much research that like, it doesn't really matter. Get your food in, mm -hmm. right? Then you have the wave of intermittent fasting and that out. So- Talk to me about your thought. I would love to hear what you think about the, the time yeah. and nutrition. So meal timing, honestly, I, I, it's, it's a hit or miss. And I think, you know, the most important thing to really approach is, right, just having a plan throughout your, your specific day, right? If that's you fasting until 11, because that's when you get hungry, by all means, allow that to happen. Um, I think, again, it's all going to be independent, of, uh, independent basis. Um, but I think, you know, the most important, I guess, timing of nutrition that I like to take advantage of is, as you said, pre and post workout. So I can understand or more importantly, really hypothesize where our carbohydrates are going and where our protein is going pre and post workout. Um, and more important, less right, there's no consequences of specifically having protein around your workout. If anything, there's only been beneficial factors that happen with utilizing that. Um, but even to kind of go into a different realm of, right, macronutrient distributions of, right, hey, right, protein is probably that, you know, that adaptive macronutrient, that I like to call it, right, it stimulates an anabolic factor when a catabolic state, rather you're dieting or not. Um, carbohydrates and fats, right? Yes, fats are essential, right, for fat soluble vitamins and testosterone and hormonal aspects. But it's all up to the individual, right? If you love higher fat, then I'm going to go ahead and feed that. And again, that's why I say a maintenance period, that maintenance week, that baseline week is really important for me to see, right? If you enjoy higher fats, I'm going to give you a percentage that is higher in fats. But if you enjoy carbs, like predominantly us do, 
I'm going to go ahead and feed you a little bit more carbohydrates. But more specifically, I think more meal timing wise, like let's go ahead and try to manipulate at least 25 to I say 45% of your carbohydrates around training one. So you get the most bang out of your bunk um, around your training. You put a lot more effort and intensity. And as I said, right, we understand that we can, again, fuel and almost like push those carbohydrates in a specific, I guess, muscle or again, intensity within your training rather than guesstimating, oh, okay, I'm going to push them all late at night. Um, although that's not a, 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 the worst approach, right? Because there's some good research. You kind of save your carbohydrates later on in the night. It helps facilitate better sleep. Um, but yeah, I, is win or miss, or you're missing out on opportunities or even the anabolic window. Um, I think it's really over overemphasizing when it doesn't make that much of a factor. Yep. And I learned that the long way, hard way after multiple years for now, again, two meals, I really care about pre and post workout. Um, at times I do some faster workouts just because of my schedule working at four o'clock. I don't want to eat. I force myself to do it, but Hey, we're there. <laughs> so the one thing that for those of you listening, we really haven't touched base on is we haven't really talked to you about fad diets, right? Fad diets are in. There's so many things going on. We're talking optimizing your performance based on what we think is really important. Nutrients, getting nutrients in your body, getting nutrients at the right timing. We can kind of go back and forth different bias, but there's so much out there, intermittent fasting, keto, um, low carb, high carbs, carb cycling. It's abundance of those things. At no point do I ever prescribe a specific diet unless you're going to see a dietitian, a registered dietitian, right? I talked to you about these diets. Let's talk about the hottest topic right now, intermittent fasting. Your thoughts on intermittent fasting? Oh, man. So, you know, I think intermittent fasting is such a, a broad term. And, you know, um, I think it's something that you can still gain a crap ton of weight on it because just because you're having a strict feeding window doesn't mean you can... Oh, not over consume on calories. Um, and I think a lot of individuals, when they think intermittent fasting, I'm increasing growth hormone, I'm increasing fat loss. And um, previously this past weekend, right, ACSM, there's literally no evidence to showing that growth hormone increases fat loss at all. Um, in that aspect, it doesn't probably even improve recovery in that aspect, because again, you could be possibly depriving yourself of nutrients. And then you and you, myself and you, you include it, right? We can kind of piggyback on Ramadan. It's a grueling process to fast for sense to sun up to send down um, and really not have any nutrients. So we kind of have to piggyback or put on the back burner our performance and our lean body gains because again, right, at the, the moment at hold is right, this spiritual month is more important than gains in the gym and feeding ourselves that stuff. So that's where I always have a phrase, right? Food is culture, culture is life. If you're not enjoying life or enjoying the aspects of life or doing something wrong here. Um, so again, flexible dieting, it's a great tool. If it allows you to create a caloric deficit, as a lot of these fat diets do, by all means, they're going to work. But again, the, the most important question you have to ask yourself is, again, is it sustainable, maintainable for your current lifestyle? If you don't see yourself doing it in the next six months, it's probably not going to work. If anything, you're going to spiral back and that rebound effect on the end of the end of the spectrum is going to come bite you back in the ass and you're going to start off from ground zero right over all over again and i want to piggyback off a comment he said about ramadan coming in i was in prime time a month out from my competition during ramadan and i put that on the back side i had bfr for my workouts i changed my workout timing but i went to work and i told my staff yo guys i'm miserable i'm not sleeping i'm hungry I'm deprived. I'm doing that. So performance is going to be key. But that's one thing. So for all the Muslims out there, you have two professionals saying the same thing. Don't worry about your gains. Don't worry about all that. Be there for spiritual reasons. Why we do the holiday. What the purpose of that is. But also, people try to maximize fat loss. People try to maximize muscle mass during that month. But is it really realistic for you? Do you really continue that lifestyle a month after? majority of us stopped fasting the day, day 30 came and even looked at Thursday and that was it. That was the end of our fasting window, right? <laughs> and never again do we go back to it. So they're like, why did I gain the weight back? It's not realistic. Set realistic goal for yourself. Choose a lifestyle choice. So it comes down to what he's saying is pick a lifestyle commitment change for yourself, right? That's the overall part of being well and fit together. You created a plan for yourself that's sustainable long-term. We're not talking a month from now. We're not talking two months from now. That's why these fads don't work well, right? 
they just die out for it. Uh, when you're talking about performance, so in terms of strength training, let's kind of go into that. So I just came off piloting me and I will tell you for a fact, intermittent fasting for me was not successful on what those numbers look like before pre post Ramadan. Right. And the biggest fuels I was missing, I think I was missing more of the essentials, right? I had my BCAs, which helped with hydration. That was one tool I did this year where in the morning and night, I loaded up on BCAs. So hydration wasn't a huge issue for me. I worked out at night, but the carbs were, I didn't want to load up on carbs pre-workout. I didn't want to load up them after because the hours did change for you. So when we're talking pure strength, what is your go-to tips for people that are, are, are taking a fat approach and that, how do you get them out of that mindset? Um, so I think if we're talking strength specific, um, if you want to get stronger at a movement, and again, this is really, really simple, but something a, a lot of people have a hard time of grasping. If you want to get strong in a specific movement, do that movement. If you want to get really strong in that movement, do that movement at high intensities for us, right? Specifically powerlifters. It would be smart for us to touch heavy weight every once in a while. If we're talking about RPE. I think top set of eights, nines. If you're talking about percentage wise, it should probably be in those 90 percentiles. You can probably get away with mid 80s. Um, but right, strength is a skill in an aspect, right? The the farther away you get from a specific movement, the harder it is to compensate for that strength. So for example, right, if I'm talking about hey, I want how strong is my quad, right? But all I do in my program is squats, but I test myself in a research conduct, um, an isometric, you know, I think a, a, a leg extension, right? Those two aren't going to co correlate at all. So as I said before, to get as specific as possible, meaning the movement, the intensity, and the type of exercise that you're going to prepare yourself or measure yourself as a measurement of indication of progress. Absolutely. And practicing makes perfect. I think the one thing I did add this time in my competition. So when I did the first competition, I didn't feel like the move, the weight was moving as fast as it should have. Right. My intensity was, I was like, wow, I struggled with that. I added some power work and I added a little bit of cardio. Right. And I think a lot of people are hesitant to do both those things in powerlifting, but it's in the sport <laughs> power work. Right. So I added some sprints. I've added a little bit of running here and there. And I do think it, it carried over. Granted the injury set me away, but in terms of how I felt, so when you're talking powerlifting, what are your thoughts about adding cardio to your powerlifting days for your athletes, those are competitors? And you yourself compete, right? Or no? Yeah, yeah. So I just, honestly, I had a competition like you uh, in the midst of Ramadan. Uh, I guess I cheated a little bit in the senses the day before um, and the day of. I didn't fast, but I made up towards, towards the uh, adding extra days for it. Um, but yeah, I think if you're not healthy, <laughs> cardiovascular, you're not going to have a, a great career in anything aspect. So um, I, I, you know, a lot of the, the, I guess the research that I uh, prioritize or I try to educate my clients on is, you know, being active throughout the day. And I set like, you know, step goals and things of that nature, but more importantly, right. Things that are going to, again, add to recovery. And I think the thing that I've worked out for myself um, is, you know, simple biking, right. It's easy on the back. Um, easier ish on the knees, but again, it's still facilitating some quad BFR in, in a sense, um, and improving, um, recovery within those quad recepts, um, and allowing again, not such a, a high intensity work. I think I know you say you're doing sprints and that, um, I'm all for that, but I also like to look at the risk, uh, risk reward ratio. Um, it's a lot easier to, I guess, possibly tear a hamstring. Um, although I don't want to go into that mindset of, Hey, if I sprint, I'm going to turn my man hamstring. At the end of the day, if that's what you enjoy, fucking do it. That's the most important thing. Like, I'm an asset, and I call myself out it on time. My left knee will develop some type of tendinopathy all the time because I love basketball. And if somebody calls me, hey, midnight, hey, let's play some hoop ball, I'm, I'm coming. Um, and we'll play for two to three hours, and the next day I'll freaking squat. And I'm an idiot, and I still have yet to learn, but I enjoy that aspect of my life that I'm not going to sacrifice – I guess, uh, you know, five, 10 pounds on the bar so, to enjoy basketball with friends and family and all of that. So at the end of the day, like I encourage cardio because one, it helps facilitate recovery Two, more importantly, it's going to improve your longevity within the sport and health aspects. That's the most important thing at the end of the day. Performance and under the bar is great. 
Um, but if you're not alive, we can't even do that. Exactly. And I, I think for the, those of you listening, we want to make sure you're addressing is that we're adding cardio to our routines, but that's not all we're doing. Right? We're focusing on the strength training. We're other, other aspects of our programming. But when you listen to his approach about both strength training as well as fat loss in terms of your diet, that comes down to is doing what you love and picking something you're really committed to, right? He's still going to give up lifting. Maybe he'll go basketball over lifting and that's fine because he loves it. He enjoys it. He's going to be more active with it. And if we're really thinking now, holistically bring our pieces together, if we're truly trying to optimize whatever fat loss goal you have, muscle mass goal you have, if you're trying to optimize your life, if you do the things you enjoy, which is the first thing he said, you're going to be sticking to that a lot more. And with that folks, we're going to take a quick break and we'll be right back with you. So we're back from this break and Adam has been nothing but pure joy and a wealth of knowledge to talk to about when it comes to optimizing our wealth and optimizing our body points. So with that, just like every episode, he's going to give us his three big tips for you on optimizing a ticket to success to change your lifestyle. So Adam, floor is yours, brother. Let's take it away. All right, man. Yeah. So I think as we kind of discussed already, right, uh, a lot of the things uh, to really, you know, enjoy life and just be successful, whatever goal that you may have. Um, it's got to be enjoyable, right? Because if it's not enjoyable, uh, burnout is more than likely going to happen sooner rather than later. Um, and then more importantly, you're going to revert back to those old behaviors that you were probably really ashamed or really upset about with yourself of trying to make these changes. So again, uh, making sure that you're enjoying this, enjoying whatever your, your, your goal is set out to be and how you would do that, right? Is have a plan. Um, again, it sounds really stupid, but a lot of people fall short of having this plan. Um, whether that is, you know, I'm going to do X, Y, Z to get me here, or, you know, this month, my goal is to read, you know, 10 pages a day and then a, a book uh, every month. You have to write, I, again, maybe another lame terminology is how are you, how do you eat an elephant? That's one bite at a time. And you kind of have to have that mindset of approach of, how am I going to get my goal in 90 days, right? One day at a time, one meal at a time. If you want to get really specific, one rep at a time. And I, I guess I like to dig really deep and get really, really freaking specific with all of my clients um, because, right, you start really craving the moment approach rather than, hey, I have to, you know, be 180 pounds in two months, right? That is all cool and dandy, but tell me how you're going to get there, right? I'm going to get into the gym. I'm going to walk 10 minutes. After that, I'm going to warm up and then I'm going to load the bar. Like literally have this plan organized within your brain and don't be afraid to deviate away from the plan. Don't be afraid to, right, if things don't go well a specific day, understand that something is always better than nothing, right? If you can't get into the gym, simple body weight circuits, shit, walking for 30 minutes is something, right? Again, don't have that all or nothing approach. Um, and then I think, again, number three, I would say is, again, get as specific as possible, um, right? If you want a fat loss, like how specific are you going to kind of do that, right? Are you going to create a deficit? Are you going to focus more on protein? Um, and always kind of have some reliable measures within that aspect. And when I say that, right, don't use the scale. The scale is just three digits and the scale doesn't take into consideration dehydration, stress, um, maybe you didn't poop for a day. Um, maybe you ate really late at night. Um, it doesn't give any real biofeedback in that aspect. And I think the best um, measurement that I currently use for my clients and myself is, you know, waist measurement, um, because it's really hard to gain muscle at the waist, right? It's predominantly either going to be fat or you're going to lose fat there. Um, and two, I would say progress pictures and progress pictures, they speak for themselves. Um, and they also really kind of Right. Because we can be our own worst enemy in that aspect because we see each other every day. Um, so have a library every Sunday at 12 uh, p.m. fasted before eating or drinking after doing the number one, number two. This is what I'm going to look like in this time. So there's no discrepancies um, in these photos and in this process, um, because, as I said, right, you can be your own worst enemy seeing yourself every day. You might not actually see the true, um, I guess, of, of results that are happening. Uh, but more importantly, right, instead of saying um, that I'm going to read or I'm going to lift, say, I am this, I am this. Because when you start identifying as that you are this, you are more than likely going to do this. But I think, again, most important thing 
I guess to kind of wrap it up is right. Your body hears everything your mind says. If you're not feeding it the right things, um, you're never going to kind of be successful. So it's 90% mental, um, 10% physical. If you can't, if you can't utilize that thing between your ears, um, you're, it's going to be a hard time. So more or less, don't focus on objective results, focus on the process and improving yourself mentally and spiritually. And with that, the physical aspects will be there before you know it. Absolutely. And I like how you put that last two great pieces of advice from Adam and the last component of mentally getting yourself there. Right. And that same in any industry, it's not just for weight loss. It's any goal you have in PT. We tell our patients first, no, you're not in pain. You think you're in pain just to start making you believe in yourself more to move it. Our job is we want to try to empower you, empower you with movement so you can start feeling better and get that. We're not here to heal you. We're here to set you up for healing processes and optimizing that. When I asked Adam some of the questions in our history, he talked about that his parents worked too hard for him to be average. He talked about empowering his clients with knowledge and education that he had. So when I listened to him speak about the passion, it comes down to is if you do what you love, you'll never work a day in your life. And you can hear that passion within him and the lessons that he taught you about optimizing your body, making the lifestyle commitment. And it goes beyond coaching. We can give you the nitty gritty. We can give you the, the details. We can give you the program. But you as a coach, can you really change the person? And it comes from your passion. So the passion you hear from his voice and the passion you hear from our voices as we talk about these things is why people love working with you, right? That's all it comes down to. If you're not passionate about it in the industry, walk out the door because you're taking away from people that are passionate about it in a sense, right? Yeah, as you uh, said, man, like our job as coaches isn't to make somebody dependent, especially like you said, in pain. Like we don't want you to be dependent. We want you to give you these tools in your toolbox. So at the end of the day, right, you feel autonomous. And if shit happens, you're like, Hey, I've done this before. I need to adjust X, Y, and Z. And then bam, hey, now I understand the process of, right, I'm autonomous and whatever is going to happen, I know right, I've been here and now I have the tools to kind of approach it. Um, but yeah, I think, again, I'd rather have clients, you know, have autonomy, have education and spread the word of, hey, man, he loves it. He made me better person, not only just in the gym, but outside the gym. And he made me realize if I can do this in the gym, I could do all of this other stuff outside of my life if I have that same approach. Um, and I think that's the goal of, of coaches being able to take a client somewhere they can't take themselves, but also in other aspects in life. And that, that's Absolutely. the beautiful thing. And that's the art I think of coaching really is. Absolutely. And it comes down to is you're not a trainer, you're a coach, right? You're an educator for the most part. Your job is to teach. And if you teach properly, you empower your client to be independent and they'll do the rest for you. Um, so with that, folks, this concludes today's episode. Adam, I thank you for coming on. You will be back on again because we have a lot more topics to cover <laughs> with you from what we had today. And I hope to see you again soon, brother. Hey, man, I appreciate it. Anytime you guys need from me, um, you want to find me, man, don't hesitate to reach out to me on Instagram at the coach AI. Um, and my email is Adam at provisique.com. Don't mind um, answering a few questions, hopping on a phone call, help anyone, man. That's that's what I'm here for. Appreciate it. And folks, you will see all his information on the tags in our bio. And until then, we'll see you again soon. Take care.